I got the math right. We're right at 101. Um, the last 20 miles have busted my ass, you know. Like, you don't think about how heroic you are or what kind of beer and how much of it you're going to drink. You're just in survival mode. All you can think about is just keep turning the cranks over and we're going to limp home to the finish line on like uh, two cylinders. Hey, what's going on everyone? If you've been following me recently, you know that I've been spending more time on land than water recently. Because one of the things I wanted to do this year was to be able to ride my bike 100 miles. They call it a bicycle century. Now then, to be completely honest, I don't think there's anything compelling about watching someone ride their bike a long ways. There's nothing being chased, there's nothing getting blown up, there's none of that stuff. But, if you have designs on doing something similar, I'm going to make a very compelling case as to why you should do it here, and why you should do it the way I did it. So first of all, let me give you a brief synopsis of the trip. Total distance is a little over 100 miles. Total time in the saddle is about six and a half hours. I'm gonna hit the play button here. Basically the trip involves starting from Duarte, riding to Seal Beach, adding a leg in between, and then finishing back up at Duarte. Now the reason I had to add a leg in the middle is because if you start from Duarte and go to Seal Beach and come back, that's about 70 miles. So somewhere in between, I had to add an additional 30 miles. Now in theory, I could have gone to Seal Beach and then hit PCH to add the 30 miles, but I wanted to be as safe as possible. I wanted to spend as little time as possible on streets. And that's going to segue nicely into what I think are important consideration when you're doing something like this. And I think I've ranked them in terms of most important to least important. And the number one factor is safety. And the great thing about this route is that virtually all of it is on a bike path like this. I think you spend a grand total of maybe 200 yards on streets. The second most important consideration I think is elevation gain. Now obviously if you have to ride 100 miles on a bicycle you want it to be as flat as possible. So going back here it shows that the total elevation gain is about 2,000 feet which seems significant but 2,000 feet over 100 miles is very very mild. I mean really you can call this route virtually flat. The third most important consideration is the mob rules. If you're going to do something like this, you want to be part of a pack. Especially if there is a headwind and there will be toward the beach. And when there is a headwind, you can probably save about 33% of your energy by being tucked in behind someone. Factor number four is wind. Wind can either be the unseen killer or it can be the unseen hand of providence. Wind is going to have a big say so as to what kind of effort you're gonna put in. I don't care if you're on a kayak or a bicycle. But when you look at a forecast, what's obvious is the temperature, but you should pay close attention to what the wind is gonna do throughout the day. Trust me, you wanna pick a day where the wind is flat. And if you have to go out on a windy day, you want to be part of a pack. Factor number five is weather. Ideal weather is what? Probably like high 60s. But again, I'd much rather deal with heat, cold, or even rain than wind. And finally, factor number six is amenities. If there happens to be a spot along the way where you can refill water or food, then all the better. Okay, onto the footage. The ride kicks off at a place called Encanto Park in Duarte. Now, this footage is at the end of the ride because I just didn't have the time early in the morning because I was too busy trying to latch on to a random pack. None of my bicycling friends were able to join me for this ride, so I got to the park around 7.30 a.m. and basically just started advertising that I was single, kind of like at a ski lift. Fortunately for me, a gal told me that I could tag along as part of her pack. 
Now don't park your car on this side of the parking lot because they play softball there and you don't want to come back to a busted windshield. And so the ride kicks off and we hit the bike trail. The weather was just okay. It would turn out to be like over 90 later on that afternoon, but the day before it was over 100, so I'm grateful. Now here's where the fiasco begins. <laughs> the guy on the left in blue getting ready to sprint is part of my adopted pack. Everyone else in this frame is not. But I don't realize that because I just met these people. So he takes off and is probably wondering, wait, why isn't this moron following me? And the people that I am following at this point are probably wondering, wait, why is this moron following us? So I don't realize my mistake for another mile or so. So at that point, I have to put on a huge solo effort to try and catch up to my adopted pack. But luckily, I was eventually able to latch on again. Now you could argue that this is probably the prettiest portion of the bike ride because you're going along the top of the dam and you get some pretty cool vistas from here. Now regardless of cadence or whatever, everyone in this group was pretty strong and there were a couple of guys in this group that were very strong. Here we are descending from the top of the dam and really this is the only meaningful elevation gain or loss to speak of on this ride. And so the descent from the dam puts us in the city of, I think this might be Irwindale, and it's probably the least scenic portion of the route. And the up and down nature of the bike path at this juncture makes it hard to maintain a good rhythm. Generally speaking, when you see a guy with a pointy helmet and water bottles behind his butt, it means that he or she is going to be pretty fast. I mean, every once in a while you're going to have a poser, but generally speaking, those guys are going to be fast. We're doing about 20 here, and obviously this guy can come and go as he pleases. About 15 miles in, we roll up on the Pico Rivera Golf Course, and this is what I was talking about in terms of amenities. This place is great for bicyclists because you can stop by, refill water, and they have an air station as well. Right around the 25 mile mark, which means we're about 10 miles from the beach, we begin to encounter the first signs of a headwind, and thus the pack goes into a single file formation. Now the guy in yellow was not part of our original group, we picked him up along the way. But you can tell by his cadence that he's probably somewhere near Redline and he would drop off in a little bit. And to be honest, I didn't do much pulling at all either because from a selfish standpoint, I had a long ways to go still. So I have to give a lot of credit to the PA Cycling Club. I think they're based out of Pasadena. They were kind enough to let me tag along without really doing my fair share of the work. And I gotta tell you, there were a couple of gals in this group that were really strong as well. You talk about putting in work, here we pass a guy in a hard hat. Here we exit a tunnel, and you can tell we're really close to the beach. Look how wide the canal is here. This section of the bike path near the beach is probably the most dangerous because there's a lot more traffic and you really have to pay attention. When we reach PCH, sadly, I have to say goodbye to my new friends because they're gonna hang out and grab some lunch or coffee. I've got too much left to do, so I need to turn right back and start pedaling. 
but first I have to fuel up. And what I learned on this trip is when it's this hot and you have to go that long, you need to be mostly on a liquid diet because you're not gonna have a lot of excess fluids to help you digest. And most of the blood is going to be diverted elsewhere, i.e. the legs. Okay, in terms of fuel, you know, the standard stuff, I got a whole giant bag of uh, trail mix. Um, and then for, you know, like the long burning stuff, I've got some peanut butter. Um, didn't bring a spoon, but I've got this really cool multi-tool, that. Um, great for scooping peanut butter out of jars, dislodging foreign objects from nostrils. So after fueling up, I start pedaling back. Now, while I do miss the strength of the pack, in this scenario, it doesn't hurt me quite as much because the wind is blowing out of the south and so I have a tailwind. Here I'm positioning my camera to get some low angle footage and I know I have to hustle because I don't want someone coming along and picking up my camera. But of course, this happens. Now here's a guy that I've seen already several times on the path. And don't let his mild-mannered Clark Kent looks fool you. Because I've seen him going to the beach and now I've seen him riding away from the beach. So he's putting in big miles. And furthermore, look at his bicycle. That is not a run-of-the-mill garden variety bicycle. Look at the wheels and look at the tires. This guy is a serious cyclist. Here I'm frantically asking him not to pick up my camera. I'm not afraid that he's going to steal it. I'm just thinking that he's going to think someone dropped it and will pick it up. And then I'll have to reposition it. But he doesn't hear me. <laughs> so here I'm rolling up to the Pico Rivera golf course again, but this time from the south. So my plan is to refill with water here, eat a little food, and then head back south again from here. So to visualize, here's what I'm doing. So we started here, and I bicycled all the way to PCH, and then I bicycled back to the Pico Rivera Golf Course, turned around, and then added 15 miles going south again, at which point I will turn around again and then head back north to finish up at Encanto Park. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, why did you choose this portion to add the 30 miles? Why not do it here at the end or here at the beach? Well, here's what I was thinking. If I do it near the beach, I'm going to have to deal with a headwind. If I do it here toward the tail end, I'm going to have to deal with heat. So my best guesstimate was that this portion right here would provide me the easiest 30 mile leg and it gives me access to the Pico Rivera golf course. Anyways, that's how I did it. Here I'm getting ready to climb the last hill to the top of the dam and I'm pretty beat here. There's one other thing I should mention. If you're going to be listening to music on a long ride, you should put together a happy playlist. And by that I mean, I typically kind of gravitate toward melancholy music, I, I like it. But the last thing you want to hear at mile 90 is melancholy music. You want something that's kind of like upbeat and uplifting. Well, that about wraps it up. I hope even a small audience will find this useful. As always, thank you for dropping by, and regardless of what it is you like to do, get out there, have fun, be safe, and we will see you soon on our next adventure. Bye for now.